ahead and start? Or? Okay. Well, thank you everybody for coming. Uh, my name is Dan Kenefick. I'm a professor at the University of Arkansas. I teach physics. I'm also interested in the history of science. Uh, as you shall see, depending on how far we get through the slides. Uh, please, by the way, jump in with questions at any point. That's usually, if you have the question, please fire away. I love questions. My students will tell you that the only disadvantage to asking me questions is how long it takes me to answer them, but I will do my best to be brief. But I will love to get a question. Um, as you'll see, I'm interested in Einstein, and that's what led me to eclipses. And they're one of those subjects that gets the more, more fascinating the more you study them. So what I'm going to talk about today is, let's, let's move ahead to the first slide. Hmm. I don't know if I do this, no, this. I think maybe it only wants me to do it with this now. Okay. Okay, so a little over a century ago, Einstein became world famous. One of those cases where it happened literally overnight. Uh, and it was because of an eclipse. Uh, his theory of general relativity, which is now our accepted theory of gravity, was um, tested at an eclipse in 1919 by British astronomers, primarily British astronomers. And uh, it really caught the public imagination for reasons that if we get around to that, we can talk in a little bit. Well, he wasn't very happy about it either. He didn't like being world famous, but there you go. Um, and of course, one of the interesting things about it is that when Einstein, this, by the way, is a headline from the New York Times after the announcement in November 1916. Earlier, take going back a few years, Einstein had realized that to test his theory, which included the prediction that since light has energy, and from his famous equation, E equal mc squared, E being energy, m being mass, if you have energy, you also have mass. And if you have mass, then surely you're affected by gravity. I think the one thing that we all know about gravity since Newton is it means mass of things attract each other, right? And if light has mass, then it gets attracted by gravity, which was something that physicists at the time did not think would happen. They thought of light as being some sort of immaterial thing that didn't interact with gravity in the way the rest of us do. So Einstein realized that if light had mass, that meant that starlight passing close to the sun would be deflected from its path. It would fall towards the sun. Now, light goes so fast that it doesn't have the same experience of falling the rest of us do. Right? This is always the moment when I realize that when you're lecturing, the only things near to you to drop are breakable. So uh, as a gravitational physicist, it pays to bring something non-breakable with you. So our usual experience about, of falling is getting hurt. Right? Our usual experience of gravity is a fairly negative one. Light doesn't really have to worry about that. By the time it's fallen significantly towards anything, it moves so quickly, it's already gone. Okay, so it got deflected a little bit, and not that much. Okay? But on the other hand, could lead to a slight change in the apparent position of stars near the sun. So Einstein thought, hey, I could get these astronomers to go and test that for me, except, of course, like everybody else, he knew that you can't see stars near the sun, except during a total solar eclipse. And so this letter is Einstein writing to a very famous American astronomer, George Ellery Hale, asking if it would be possible to observe the deflection of starlight during the daytime without an eclipse. Uh, oh, here he says, uh, by Taga in the daytime without a solar eclipse. Uh, and of course, Hale wrote back and said, no, astronomers can't do that. But he said, here are some people who know a lot about going to eclipses and doing astronomy, so I think you should talk to them. And so Einstein did that. And in 1917, having spent a few years drumming up interest, it turned out that the English decided, hey, let's go do this. Okay. And uh, they pointed out that the 1919 eclipse would be just perfect because there would be bright stars close to the sun, which is obviously what you need. And the real question that I want to ask and answer today is, how did they know? How did they know that there would be an eclipse visible at precisely that day in that year, that it would be a particularly long eclipse, which was good for their experiment, that it would take place when the sun was in a, per, in a given position in the sky, and so on and so forth. When you think about it, it's pretty remarkable, especially if you consider that although we're in the same situation right now, although we know that in a month the eclipse will happen, and we know pretty much to the second when, I'm unfortunately unable to tell you whether you're going to be able to see it, because I have no idea what the weather's going to be like. So if we think of prediction as being something that scientists would like to do, and I feel like it is something that we find pretty remarkable, it's pretty amazing <laughs> that we found some things that we could predict and other things that we couldn't. 
And as a matter of fact, you can also argue that we physicists have sort of cheated over the years. And we have simply called the things that we could predict physics and called the things that we couldn't predict something else. So for instance, the weather, that's the meteorologist's problem. I don't know why they can't do it. Right. But clearly it's physics, but we, we can't do that one. So, And similarly, astronomy, my wife in the front here is an astronomer. So over the years, we physicists have sidled up closer and closer to the astronomers and pretended they're with us because astronomy is an area where you can predict things. And eclipses, I suppose, are perhaps the most important example of that. Uh, OK, so interestingly, there's a connection between Einstein and the man who is supposed to have first predicted an eclipse. So before I introduce that man, I'm going to talk a little bit about the connection. Uh, Einstein actually had two reasons for thinking that starlight should be deflected by the sun. The first is that he thought that light has weight. It has mass. Therefore, it has weight. Therefore, it falls. He also thought that gravity changes the shape of space. Instead of what we in the field would call flat space, by which we mean Euclidean geometry, if you remember Euclid and his rules of geometry, they don't apply everywhere. Right? If you draw a triangle, such as the one here, then the, thesis, the theorem of Thales of Miletus, sometimes called the first scientist, says that the internal angles of the triangle will add up to 180 degrees. And that's an elementary proof of it there, but we won't go through it. Um, and however, that's only true on a flat space like this screen. If I draw a big triangle on the surface of the Earth, actually the internal angles of the triangle will be more than 180 degrees. That's called positive curvature. So that actually is what gravity does. It actually warps the, space, the shape of space-time. And that means that parallel lines are no longer parallel, which actually tends to focus things. For instance, if I decided to do an experiment now and I said, everybody go outside, line up, and face north, and I all want you to walk north and stay as parallel as possible. In Euclidean geometry, that means we would never meet, right? because parallel lines never cross. But if we all walk north, will we ever meet? We will. We'll meet at the North Pole. right? So in curved geometry, parallel lines are focused. And so in, in the case of uh, the light from the eclipse, there's two things that are focusing the light, falling and warpage of space time. And so Einstein wanted both these things to be tested at the eclipse. And this all comes down to something that's very familiar to astronomers today, what's called gravitational lensing. The sun does a very weak job, because gravity here in the solar system is actually pretty puny. I know it seems strong to us, but it's actually pretty puny compared to what's out there in the universe. Black holes and galaxies do a tremendous job of focusing light, which means that astronomers, like Julia, can see things much further away than they otherwise could if there happens to be a friendly galaxy or black hole between us and that other object. So it's a pretty exciting part of science today. But back in the time we're speaking of, around 1913, it was all brand new. And Einstein was trying to convince people about it. So I mentioned Thales of Miletus because, as it happens, he produced this theorem, which is very important to our understanding of Einstein's theory. He is supposed to have been, by tradition, the first person to successfully predict an eclipse. And that eclipse took place in 585 BC. So we're talking about two and a half thousand years ago. So that's a pretty long history of eclipse prediction. And this eclipse is famous in more ways than one because it actually is alleged to have taken place during a battle. Uh, the track of totality passed right over the battlefield. Two armies, the Medes and the Lydians, were engaged in combat. And supposedly, the battle stopped. Everybody was so shocked that the sun was hidden from view that they decided they'd better stop and uh, apparently came to some kind of a peace. Um, if you're wondering who the Medes and the Lydians were, well, the Medes were reasonably close relations of the Persians. Their empire that they were building at this time very shortly after became the famous Persian empire of Darius and Xerxes and so on. Uh, and the Lydians, they were neighbors of the Greeks. They were neighbors of Thales. Uh, they lived in modern-day Turkey, which is also where Thales lived, although he was Greek in culture. Um, it's worth mentioning that Thales didn't really know how an eclipse happens. He didn't understand, as far as we know, that the moon got in the way of the sun. He didn't even know that the Earth was spherical. He began, he was at the very beginnings of what we call Greek science. But he was not at the beginning of astronomy, because, of course, in Mesopotamia, in what's now Iraq, uh, 
They had already been observing the moon and the sun for centuries. And they had observed closely and kept careful enough records that they were able to learn something called the Saros cycle. And uh, this is a prediction of when eclipses will occur based purely on empirical evidence, the idea that they see a recurring pattern. So if we want to talk about the Saros cycle for a minute, uh, first of all, we need to understand, obviously, why an eclipse happens. As I said, the moon gets in the way of the sun. Obviously, every month, the moon is roughly between us and the sun. That's called a new moon because, of course, at that time, the brightly lit part of the sun, of the moon, I'm sorry, which is facing the sun, is faced away from us. And what we see is the darkly lit half. And, of course, we therefore can't see the moon at that point, so we're not conscious of a new moon and what it looks like. It is, of course, followed by a crescent moon, and that's when we start to see it again. Um, the time between new moons is called a synodic month. And while the moon is in the general direction of the sun at that time, for an eclipse to occur, the moon also has to be directly between us. And unfortunately, most months, the moon is either above or below the sun at new moon. So the moon in its orbit is tilted with respect to the orbit of the Earth around the sun. That plane of that orbit, the Earth-Sun orbit, is called the ecliptic, for the very obvious reason that that's where eclipses take place. So the moon passes through the ecliptic twice a month, and those points are called nodes. And the time between passages through the nodes makes up a draconic month. That name probably, it seems pretty certain, comes from an ancient Greek belief common to many peoples, but the animal changes, that a dragon was eating the moon uh, of the sun, and that's what happened during an eclipse. And if you began to understand astronomy, but you knew the story about the dragon, then you gradually came to realize, oh, the dragon lives at the nodes, because that's where the moon is <laughs> when eclipses happen. And so the time between nodes is still called the draconic month in honor of that ancient Greek dragon. Uh, so it turns out that the synodic month and the draconic month are different. And they, it takes them a long time to come back around at, just so that you have an even number of both. 223 synodic months is equal to 242 draconic months. So after 223 months, you will get another eclipse if you just observe one. That's a little over 18 years. So we know in a Saros series, Saros comes from an ancient Babylonian word. In a Saros series, we know we will have a repeat eclipse. So 18 years and a couple of weeks after the eclipse next month, there will be another eclipse, not almost certainly, not, I happen to know, not visible here in Arkansas. We don't have to wait 18 years for any eclipse because at any given moment there are a number of Saros cycles operating, more than a dozen. So eclipses take place roughly once every year or two, somewhere in the world. What I have up on the screen for you is the Antikythera mechanism. I don't know if any of you have ever heard of this. If you have, you'll have heard talk about an ancient Greek computer, a uh, mechanical computer using gears and cogs, obviously not an electronic computer. And it was designed for astronomical prediction. And we can be almost certain that one of its main functions was to predict eclipses because one of the gears, I don't know if it's the one we can see here, is, has been counted to have 232 teeth. And that's exactly the number of months in a in a Saros cycle, so probably that gear was involved in the prediction of eclipses. So already at this time, which would have been hundreds of years after Thales, the Greeks were using machines to predict eclipses, which was pretty incredible. They weren't as good at it as we were, but they were obviously pretty impressively good. Do we know that Thales really predicted the eclipse? He might have known that there had been another eclipse visible by somebody in the Near East 18 years before. So he might have decided to take a flyer that that eclipse would be visible in his uh, region, in which case he just got lucky. But we really don't know for sure. OK, so the person who is usually credited, and as I said again, please jump in if you have questions. I'm sure questions are coming to your mind. Uh, the person who is credited with coming up with the correct theory of eclipses, that the moon is blocking our view of the sun, was this man, Anaxagoras. Uh, who was another Ionian philosopher. He lived on the Turkish side of the Aegean Sea. And he, it was he who said, I think what's going on is that the moon is blocking our view of the sun. The sh we're, we're, we're feeling the shadow of the moon. And Anaxagoras, he was kind of an older contemporary of Socrates. So he lived at that time when Greek philosophy was really coming to its um, 
uh, I don't know that it was exactly its high point, but the moment at which it really sprang into, into life um, uh, with Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. And Anaxagoras was a forerunner of theirs. And a very influential man, here's a painting, a later painting, obviously, of him with Pericles, the great Athenian orator and leader. And there is a story that Pericles, who was a huge admirer of Anaxagoras, was leading the Athenian army and fleet out on an expedition during the Peloponnesian War, of which he was one of the main leaders. And a solar eclipse took place. Apparently, this was in 4, 431 BC. Of course, nowadays, we can go back and predict precisely when these eclipses took place. So for instance, that earlier battle uh, that took place during Thales' eclipse, it's often said to be the earliest date that we know in history. Because if it's true that it happened during an eclipse, we can tell what day of which year that battle happened. Yes? Is there a pattern to the appearance of the locations? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. So. Uh, if, for instance, in a given Saros series, each eclipse in the series will be a little further east. As the series goes on in the bigger picture, the eclipses will start in a given series. They will start in the north and work their way south. So our particular eclipse that's coming up, it's visible here in Arkansas, which is in the northern hemisphere. So that Saros series of which it's a part is still in its relatively early stages. It's not reached, those eclipses have not reached down to the equator. Later on, they'll be seen in the southern hemisphere. Of course, right now, there are some Saro series that are older, and they're providing eclipses for southern hemisphere people to view. But yes, there is a reasonable, reasonably, well, a very predictable, but even roughly predictable, you don't have to do. The kind of calculations to predict precisely where it's visible are very intense calculations. I'll only outline them how they came to be successful. Uh, but you can even sort of roughly have a, have a, a quick guess at where it will be next. Yeah. Because, for instance, I know the one in 2017 traveled the opposite direction yes, and that's all true. that. So it's all yes. Like, okay. that, that part of it, as you said, uh, they always go from west to east. Uh, but as you say, in 2017, it went from northwest to southeast, and in this way, it's going the other. Uh, I don't know to what extent that's so easily predictable from one to the next. Um, although it does happen that the Saros series has such a perfect uh, uh, replicability that mostly it will, the next eclipse will, in many, many respects, in this series, 18 years from now, will look in many, many respects very similar to this one that we're going to have. Whereas that one in 2017, that was part of a different Sarah series. Uh, OK. So oh, yes, I guess I was going to say uh, that the eclipse happened. And of course, what did the Greek sailors and soldiers do? They said, this is a terrible omen. We're not going, guys. I mean, what could be more? The gods are sending us a pretty clear message here. And it's said that Pericles got up and held up his cloak. Uh, oh, uh, one of the most fearful men was his helmsman who was going to be steering his ship. And he held up his cloak to, so the man was in the shadow of his cloak and said, are you scared of my cloak? And the guy goes, no. And he says, well, okay. Why are you scared of the shadow of the moon? That's all that's happening. I spoke to Anaxagoras. He explained the whole thing to me. Okay. It's just the shadow of the moon. What are you worried about? Okay. So this is a very interesting moment in history, arguably. Certainly many philosophers have made a bit of a deal about it. It's a changeover from the old view that the gods are interfering in our day-to-day -day lives and sending us warnings and omens and making the eclipse happen to let the Athenians know to the idea, no, this is just a natural phenomenon. It's no different from any other kind of a shadow phenomenon that we see in our day-to-day -day lives. So quite a different take on reality. Well, after... It, we, Greek philosophy is divided into the pre-Socratic era and the post-Socratic era. In the post-Socratic era, things just really took off. Many of the subjects that we know today, like physics, had been named. Uh, astronomy was really developing. Remember, Anaxagoras was maybe the first person to understand what's really happening in an eclipse. Within a couple of centuries, you had astronomers like Hipparchus, who had marvelous models of the solar system worked out and were brilliant scientists by anybody's standards. And Hipparchus actually worked out how far away the moon is by observing an eclipse. As the Greek world got bigger following the victories of Alexander the Great, taking over the Persian Empire, which had been the Median Empire, um, the Greeks could 
hear from other Greeks who had seen the eclipse from a different place. So concerning an eclipse of Hipparchus's lifetime, and we don't even know for sure which eclipse it was. It may have been, for instance, the eclipse of 129 BC, or it could have been an earlier eclipse in 190 BC. But Hipparchus knew that this eclipse in Alexandria, which is where many of the great scientists of that era were based in Egypt, uh, was not total. But that it was total in his home part of the world, Nisea, up near uh, what's now Istanbul, up again in Turkey. Right, so kind of in the Greek area. Um, so he was able to work out, and here's a diagram. I won't go into any great detail, but you can see the A there is Alexandria. The H is the Hellespont, which is the old name for that Bosphorus region there in Turkey near Istanbul. And what he realized is if we knew that at H you had a total solar eclipse, but at A you could still see part of the moon, then you could actually use your knowledge of geometry, which the Greeks were very good at by that time, to actually work out the length D between the center of the Earth and the Moon. And it was a pretty good estimate of the distance to the Moon. So it's an example. Now, once you understand eclipses, once you're observing them meticulously, especially you might have astronomers in different places, you can actually learn things that you could never have figured out any other way. Right? Nobody had really had any idea how far away the moon was. And it's, it's a very big distance away, right? Much bigger than any earthly distances. Is this uh, an understanding that the Earth was round at this point? Yes, that's right. That's right. <coughs> By this stage, not only did they know the Earth was round, but Aristarchus of Samos, who was about a century earlier than Hipparchus, had already worked out how big the Earth is. Yeah. Pretty reasonably well. Yeah. So you, he did need that information, too, you know, to know how, how big the Earth was. So they were building on... Uh, each other and using eclipses to their advantage to try to further their knowledge of the solar system. So did they have the understanding at that time that the uh, Earth uh, rotated around the sun? Uh, so at that time, uh, at that time, most models, including Hipparchus's, had the Earth at the center. Um, there are a couple of reasons for that. One is that their physical ideas sort of seem to suggest that that made sense. The other is, of course, that's where their observations were. It's actually quite a nuisance to translate your observations from the system you're in, Earth, to a sun-centered system. One of the things that really sets Copernicus apart from everybody before him was he actually sat down and spent years working through all that, making the calculations. Uh, it's a big thing to do. It's not as if people didn't have the idea. Aristarchus, who I mentioned, realized uh, when he worked out the size of the Earth, he also had estimates of the size of the moon and the sun. Not great estimates, but enough to realize the sun is much bigger than either the moon or the earth. It's clearly further away. That much was obvious to them, all of these guys. And so he said, it doesn't make sense to me that this big thing is moving around this tiny thing. Shouldn't it be the other way around? And he proposed the so-called heliocentric system. But it just didn't take hold until a later time. Uh, so basically, they still were in an earth-centered system. Um, Another example of using the eclipses to your advantage uh, in order to uh, make, learn something about the world around you, in this case specifically our world around you, is uh, the most famous astronomer of antiquity, Ptolemy, Claudius Ptolemaeus, uh, who uh, was another Greek who lived in Alexandria. Of course, Egypt is not Greece, but it had been conquered by the Greeks, and so it was ruled by Greeks. Uh, Ptolemy, in fact, his surname is that of one of Alexander's generals, uh, Cleopatra, for instance, was part of that family. Um, so uh, Ptolemy realized that in a lunar eclipse, we all see the eclipse at the same moment. Because in the lunar eclipse, what we're seeing is the shadow of the Earth falling onto the moon. And of course, that happens at a certain given moment, right? The shadow reaches the moon, and that's it. And we all see it at the same time. That, of course, is not necessarily true with the solar eclipse. The shadow of the moon will sweep across America and Mexico from west to east. And uh, we'll, um, we'll see it later, for instance, than the people down here. Not much later, because if you want to follow the eclipse, if you want to see extra eclipse, how fast do you have to travel? The first people to do it were uh, people for the eclipse of 1973, because Concord had just been built, wasn't yet in service. And some people leased Concord so that they could fly in the past. So you have to travel supersonically to stay, to keep up with the shadow of the moon. But with a lunar eclipse, we all see it at exactly the same moment. Well, one of the big problems of antiquity was that it was hard to work out longitude, where you are east or west, because to do that, you need something to measure time. And they didn't have any good clocks. Uh, 
But Ptolemy, actually it probably was Hipparchus who realized this, Ptolemy decided to use Hipparchus' idea to figure out if two people saw a lunar eclipse in two different places, but they each reported the time, you could work out the difference in longitude, which would be very important to working out the size of the Earth. So he, uh, he went ahead and looked for a lunar eclipse that had been observed by people in two different places, and he complained, why don't we have more observations? But there weren't very many astronomers in those days. But it turns out that there was an eclipse only a week or two before Alexander's most famous battle, the Battle of Gaugamela, sometimes known as Arbella, which was the final battle in which he defeated the Persian king. Incidentally, the, the eclipse may have played a big role in the battle. Really, Alexander had no business attacking the Persian army. It was vastly bigger than his, and the Persian king had offered him half his empire, and all of Alexander's generals said, okay, let's take that deal. <laughs> We're not gonna attack that insanely big army. But Alexander noted that in the previous battle, the Persian king had run away. So he figured if he could just get the guy nervous enough, he'd flee. And so his battle plan was all about taking a charge at the Persian center at the critical moment. Luckily for Alexander, this eclipse happens a week or two beforehand. You can imagine that the poor old Persian king was thinking, oh my god, an eclipse, this is terrible. Right, so it may have helped him. At any rate, the eclipse was famous enough because it was associated with Alexander that it was observed and reported as being observed both with his army near Arbella and at Carthage in the west, more in the western Mediterranean. And so Ptolemy was able to use these two observations to give an estimate of the longitudinal stretch of the Mediterranean. Turns out this had a major impact on world history because Ptolemy also, like Aristarchus, measured the size of the earth, but he got a much lower value, an incorrectly lower value. And it turns out that, of course, the clocks weren't good, so the reported times of the eclipses at Arbella and Carthage weren't very good either. So he had too long of a longitude. So if you take the size of the earth, and subtract off, which is too small, and subtract off the known world at that time, which was too big, you get that it's actually not that far to sail west from Spain to China. So Columbus said, yeah, I could do that. Of course, he couldn't have. He'd have definitely been dead if there wasn't another continent if you're standing on that happened to be in his way. But we're lucky that he had these numbers to go on. And the reason, part, part of the reason for these numbers is this eclipse method of Ptolemy's. Okay, I'm now going to take you out of the Greek world. We're going to go into the Middle Ages, because we don't have time to talk about every Greek. Um, it is, of course, tempting to say, and people say it a lot here in Europe, in America and in Europe, where I'm from, that, oh, you know, there was a dark age, and then, luckily, Greek science came back to the European. Okay, well, this is rubbish. Greek science hadn't been in Europe, okay, technically the Greeks are part of Europe, but we only call it Europe to include the Greeks. I mean, Europe originally was just the name the Greeks had for their side of that Hellespont or Bosphorus. Uh, in the time of the Greeks, the people of Ireland and England, I'm from Ireland, uh, were not doing a whole lot of astronomy. And although they did get introduced to Greek culture through the Romans, the one bit of Greek culture that the Romans felt they weren't that great at was astronomy. The Romans did not translate Ptolemy's great book into Latin. When the Greeks, if they did go into a bit of a decline, astronomy did not just sort of pass into some sleep. It just moved back to where it had always been in the Middle East. Uh, meanwhile, in Ireland and England, they were trying to do their best. And they needed astronomy for certain things. So for instance, they now followed a Middle Eastern religion. Christianity is obviously based on the Jewish model. And they wanted to have one of their important festivals, Easter, at roughly the same time that Jesus had been crucified in the Jewish calendar, which is to say Passover. But Passover, the Jewish calendar, it's lunar. So they had to have it at a full moon after the spring equinox, because that's what they felt was kind of in, in line with what the Greeks were doing. But that meant that these poor old Irish and English monks had to, uh, and Roman monks, had to actually work that out. And what they had was tables that had been made by the Greeks and passed down, and themselves no great expertise in doing it. The problem was that the Irish and the Roman monks came up with two different methods of doing it. And so the scene that we're setting here, this is Whitby in the northeastern part of England, which was a great abbey in those days. There's the ruins of a later part of the abbey. Uh, Dracula comes ashore there in the original novel, incidentally. Um, so um, at Whitby, 
uh, there was a king of Northumbria in those days, and he was married. He was from the north of England, so he had been Christianized by the Irish monks, diligently working a way to spread Christianity as it had been spread to them by the famous St. Patrick. Meanwhile, his wife was from southern England. She had been Christianized by the Roman monks. So they celebrated Easter at different dates. And this was a pain in the rear for the king, because when his wife was already eating her Easter chocolate, I guess they didn't have chocolate, but something good, he was still fasting for Lent, and that and then, lo and behold, an eclipse occurred in 664 uh, uh, CE, we're supposed to call it now AD, um, which swept right through Northumbria. And of course, I'm sure that those monks had been telling him, well, I know your majesty is upset, but it's here in the tables. This is, these tables are totally accurate. Okay? The tables give you dates for the new moon. The king couldn't check the tables because, as I told you, it's very hard to see a new moon. But an eclipse can only happen at the new moon. It immediately became obvious that the tables sucked. They were wrong by a couple of days. Uh, and so at that point, I think the king's patience snapped. We don't know the full story, but it seems reasonable that the reason the Synod of Whitby happened in the same year of the eclipse was the king said, OK, I think we're going to sort this out, guys, and decide to do it one way or the other, because they both suck. Uh, and so he came down on the Roman side. We Irish are still upset about it. We're still banging on about it 1,500 years later. It was our one moment in the sun when we were important. And the English said, well, the Romans seem much more important than you guys, so we're going with them. Typical stuff. Um, I will, however, point out something about the English that is not reflecting very favorably on them, because in the Irish annals, the date of this eclipse is given correctly as May 1st, 664. We now know that was the date because we can calculate it back. In the English annals of the famous Venerable Bede, if you've ever heard of him, uh, it's down as May 3rd. Why did he give the wrong date? Almost certainly because that was the date that was in their table that they were using. So basically, it's an example of scientific fraud apparently invented by the English. They get away with everything. Um, OK, so in fairness, I'm sure somebody else had done it before. Uh, OK, I cannot n pass up the opportunity to tell you at least one of the great Muslim Arab astronomers of the Middle Ages, a man called al-Batani. I have written up his full name because I think his name is so brilliant. Abu Ab, and I, I can't pronounce it properly, but anyway. Abu Abd Allah Muhammad. Ibn Jabir, Ibn Sinan, al-Raqi, al-Harani, al-Sabi, al-Batani. So what's great about his name is that it tells you a lot about his life. OK, so first of all, we learn Abu Abd Allah Muhammad, he was a Muslim. That's important because we'll come back to another bit of his name. Ibn Jabir, Ibn Sinan, that's interesting because that's his father. And we know that his father was a maker of astronomical instruments. So that tells you he was actually part of a family of astronomically interested people. This was a part of the world where astronomy really mattered. Not so much in England and Ireland. It mattered a little bit, but not that much. Um, and uh, al-Raqi, al-Harani means he was born in Haran, which is now, uh, w these are both in Syria, really, but nowadays Haran is just across the border in Turkey. And Raqi was an important uh, town in Syria. Uh, that's where he lived, and that's where he observed eclipses. As-Sabi, uh, he means he's a Sabian. And in his particular case, he was descended from the people of Haran, who were traditional, before his time, he was a Muslim, they were traditional polytheistic star worshipers. They were people to whom astronomy was literally a religion. Observing the stars was part of their life. And so he sort of inherited that tradition, as well as being part of the newer era of Arab astronomy. Um, it was people like him who had already translated important Greek texts into their language, Syriac, which is a variant of Aramaic, which is what Jesus spoke. Uh, it was people like him who translated those texts into Arabic for the new Arab-speaking rulers. Um, but by his time, which is around 900, in the 900s, by his time, of course, the language had mostly changed. Most people spoke Arabic. Um, and uh, uh, so at any rate, he observed two solar eclipses in his lifetime. And what's interesting is, again, there's a tendency for people in the West to try to claim, oh, you know, the Arabs did a good job of preserving astronomy. But as anyone who knows about translating science will tell you, you can't translate scientific textbooks unless you're actually a scientist. <laughs> unless you understand the terms, it's impossible to make a proper translation. The people who did these translations were themselves astronomers who were advancing the body of astronomical knowledge. For, as an example, Al-Batani was the first person to conclusively prove that the moon does not orbit the Earth in a circle. 
If it did, it would always be at the same distance, which means all eclipses would look alike. But we know, and we have experienced just this year, already in the past, uh, the academic year, I'm an academic, so. Uh, in, 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 only a few months ago, there was an annular eclipse visible in um, uh, the western United States. That's when the moon is in front of the sun, but it's a little further away, so it looks smaller in the sky, not quite big enough to block out the sun, and then you see the sun with a ring around. And so he observed in his time, one of these two eclipses was an annular eclipse. He didn't see it in full annularity. But he realized, oh, OK, that definitely shows that the moon is sometimes further away. So the idea which the Greeks had had that the heavenly bodies could only orbit in perfect circles had to be wrong. So he was the first person to really conclusively prove that, which, of course, was very important later in the history of science. Um, the other important thing to note is that he observed eclipses so accurately, so carefully, with such attention to detail, giving the place of observation, the time of observation quite accurately. Timekeeping had advanced since the Greek period. Uh, that it was possible later on for Edmund Halley, famous for his work with comets, uh, but much else besides, to realize that if the month had always been the same length that it is now, it couldn't have been observed at that time. But he knew that Albatani probably didn't make a mistake, so he decided the month actually must be changing. And we now know that this is true, because the moon, in addition to its slight variation during a month, is progressively moving away from us, for reasons that I won't go into today, unless people are really keen. We can measure this very accurately, because the Apollo astronauts left uh, retro reflectors on the moon. You can now fire a laser at the moon, and the light will bounce back. And from the time it takes, you can work out precisely how far away the moon is. And we know that it's getting a little further away every year. Really, how much? Four centimeters. Thank you. Every year, the moon gets four centimeters further away from us. Uh, and that means that the month is getting longer. Now, mind you, it's a little confusing because there's a fewer, a, shorter, a fewer number of days in each month. That's because the moon is getting further away by stealing some of our rotation, which means that our day is slowing down. In the time of the dinosaurs, the days were only 21 hours long. That's the real reason they went extinct, incidentally. There just wasn't enough time to get everything done. Uh, OK, so um, how are we doing for time? Kelly, when should I stop? I should ask the audience that. <laughs> Um, so I want to talk a little bit about Columbus, because when we talk about the science of prediction and predicting eclipses, one of the most famous examples of how impressive that can be is from a story about Columbus. So we've already discussed that he was misled by data that partly came from an eclipse into launching his voyage, and he found himself in the wrong place. Uh, and he, thought, he, he ended up being governor of the island of Jamaica. The king of Spain had just said, hey, you can govern that island. The poor local people, uh, the native people of Jamaica, uh, were actually incredibly accommodating. And when Columbus landed, they provided him and his men with food. But after a while, they noticed that these European guys didn't seem to be that interested in helping to grow the food. They just wanted to eat the food. So they said, hey, that's enough with the free lunch, guys. So Columbus looked at his, um, his ephemeris. So I mentioned the astronomical tables that the Irish monks had. The astronomical tables are pretty hard to work with. I wouldn't have liked to give the impression that those monks were totally illiterate guys who didn't understand science. They had to be able to understand science to use a table and convert it into data, into predictions. It, a big time astronomer, we'll come back to some of them maybe if there's time, uh, would be the kind who would produce the tables. Then another astronomer might take the tables and produce what's called an ephemeris, comes from the similar word from ephemeral, something that doesn't last very long, that would provide a few years' worth of more precise, easy-to-read predictions. And then somebody else, lower down the uh, you know, training line, could take an ephemeris and produce an almanac, which gives you just what you need to know for the year ahead. So the ephemeris was something that Coper Copernicus needed to have, uh, I'm sorry, Columbus needed to have, because, of course, he was a navigator, right? So he needed to use, help use the stars and so on. And so he knew from his ephemeris that there was going to be a lunar eclipse upcoming. So he decided to put one over on the poor innocent people of Jamaica. So he told them, my God is angry with you, and he is going to hide the light of the moon. And according to the story, we don't really have any particular reason to doubt it, the poor Jamaicans were so upset 
that they asked Columbus to bring the moon back, tell him God, his God they were sorry, and then Columbus said, okay, I'll do it for you. And the moon came back, and they actually started feeding his men again, which was a big mistake. Um, I don't know if you guys know how all that turned out, but anyway, it's not part of our story. Um, so uh, another lunar eclipse a little later, in uh, sorry, no, a solar eclipse in 1560 was observed by Tycho Brahe, and he was the astronomer who really set everything on a path of even greater precision. Of course, we already saw how impressive Albatani was, but Tycho Brahe had more resources. He was a nobleman himself. He had the ear of the King of Denmark and later the Holy Roman Emperor. So he could build a big observatory with big, large equipment and observe every night. And so that started the path towards the kind of precision measure, uh, predictions that we're going to talk about now. And that was especially made possible by this man, Johannes Kepler, who was Brahe's successor as imperial mathematician, who, using Brahe's measurements, was able to prove something that Albatani had already hinted at. The planets do not move in circles. Kepler was the one who figured out that they move in ellipses. And once you have the correct shape, it gets a lot more possible to predict exactly where everything is. And of course, also, I should have mentioned, he is, of course, now working with the heliocentric system of Copernicus. Right? But Copernicus's system didn't work as well because he was still stuck in the old circles, right? which didn't really work. So Kepler was able to produce a new set of tables called the Rudolphine tables after the Holy Roman Emperor, who was his employer. And these Rudolphine tables finally brought in the era of precision, precision prediction. You could tell exactly when, to less than an hour, an eclipse would occur. You could even predict transits of planets across the sun. For the first time, as a result of Kepler's tables, astronomers were able to observe Venus crossing the face of the sun, uh, which is something that, for various reasons, turned out to be quite important. Yes. What do you attribute the particular interest in like, the current eclipse? Mm -hmm. I mean, like it's, because I mean, I know that the one that happened in 2017 was, mm -hmm. uh, it was in, in the autumn equinox, like, you know, at the, and this is like happening more closer to the spring equinox. Mm -hmm. And I mean, are eclipses typically fall in spring or is there no seasonal relation? There is, there is what's called an eclipse season, but an eclipse season really just refers to the period of the new moon. Which so it's is not connected moon. to it's, it's not connected to the solar seasons because it's it's really the moon's orbit that's important. Because I mean, it's truly, I mean, I was an educator for years. I'm retired now, but yes. I mean, for much time, it didn't seem that people seemed that interested. And suddenly, I mean, mm -hmm. as we know, the entire country is talking about mm -hmm. this particular mm -hmm. one. Uh, I mean, yes. is there, are you attributing that to any certain thing, or? Uh, I think uh, well, it's it's perhaps particularly advantageous in this part of the country because, of course, people uniquely, really, it's very rare, very rare, not unique, but very rare, have had the chance to talk to people who've seen it happen. Right? So uh, for instance, I'm from Ireland. Uh, we'll, in a minute here, we'll, we'll see the last time Ireland had a, an eclipse, a solar, total solar eclipse, 1724. The, ne the next one's going to be 2090. That's more typical. In this case, you have the unique position that people can talk to someone who saw it the last time and tell, oh yeah, it was amazing. I think you should go, I'm going to go again. You should see it, right? So in other words, if it happens once in your lifetime and you didn't realize it was going to be that big of a deal, you missed it. Too bad. <laughs> Probably won't come again in your lifetime, in your region. But in our case, we have this advantage that there was a precursor. If you didn't get to see it, you probably met someone who saw it and was excited. So this time you're thinking, hey, I think I'll go see it. So I don't know for sure, but it might be simply that. And that is very unusual. Uh, hard to find an example of a, two eclipses crossing each other within only less than a decade. There are very few other examples. I think Nova Scotia, uh, uh, any Carly Simon fans here, you may know that the guy who was so vain flew his Learjet up to Nova Scotia to see a total eclipse of the sun. That song was released in the very early 70s. It's actually quite hard to figure out what eclipse they're talking about because Nova Scotia had two, one in 1970 and one in 1972. So that's even better. <laughs> <laughs> and apparently it might have been the 72 one that he flew his Learjet up there, but I'm not entirely certain about that. Uh, so it's very rare to have two one after the other, and I think that might help because, you know, if you've only got one, it's too late afterwards to wish you'd gone. It only lasts a few minutes and the chance doesn't come again. Um, okay, here is the very next slide. Uh, so Kepler came up with his laws of planetary motion, came up with these very accurate tables you could predict an eclipse. Then, of course, Isaac Newton, 
great English mathematician and astronomer, built upon Kepler's work and came up with a, what we would call a full modern theory of what's going on. It's the gravity of the Earth that keeps the moon in orbit and the gravity of the sun that keeps us moving around the sun. Once you understand that, you have a system of equations and a calculational method, calculus, which he invented himself, which you can use to really work things out very precisely. And his close colleague, Edmund Halley, who is the guy who persuaded him to write all this to tell the world, Newton was such a private guy. He, as far as we can tell, he literally wasn't going to tell anybody until Halley persuaded him, look, write this down, and I will publish it for you. OK, just keep writing. Don't stop writing. Okay. Um, and so then Halley did the calculations. He was an expert astronomer. And here, he showed the track of the eclipse of 1715. So here's another case. The English of the early 18th century, they were lucky too, 1715 to 1724, so about nine years. And this is the track of the eclipse as Halley calculated it. And he drew it on a map so that people in England would know it was coming, know where to be to see it, just as we can today. Uh, I think maybe one person before Halley had drawn a track on a map. Um, but Halley was really the first to do it in a big way. He wasn't exactly correct. He was about 10 miles out. This line is the corrected one after the fact. And now he's taken the opportunity to draw the 1724 eclipse in there, too. And you can see that one crosses Ireland. That was the last one to be visible in Ireland, actually, as it happens. Um, so this is pretty exciting. This is the moment where prediction gets real. You can know it's happening. And it had a big effect, not only on science, but on the way we observe the world. Because it's striking the extent to which before prediction, People didn't talk about some of the important things of eclipses that we know about today. The corona, for instance, which is the atmosphere of the sun. The sun is so, the moon, by sheer coincidence, happens to precisely obscure the body of the sun, but nothing else. Right? There are other big moons in the solar system. When they obscure the sun, everything's gone. No corona, no nothing. We get to see the corona like a halo around the moon. But people didn't mention this in the old days. Why? Probably because they were hiding. They were thinking, is it going to come back? What's going to happen? Oh my god, it was scary. It was frightening. It's only when you can know it's happening that you can think, well, I'm going to try to observe this and see what I can see. Um, OK, there is time, luckily, to say something about an American eclipse. Uh, Benjamin Franklin um, wanted to see a lunar eclipse in 1743. All excited about it as we are. Well, a big nor'easter blew up, and he couldn't see a thing. Thick, heavy cloud, probably rain and snow coming down. I don't know what time of year it was. Uh, and he wrote to his brother, who lived in Boston, to kind of commiserate. I'm sure you also were disappointed to miss the eclipse. And the brother wrote back from Boston and said, oh, no, no, the, the storm passed over later. We got a perfect view of the eclipse. Well, Franklin knew, just as Ptolemy had known, that everybody sees a lunar eclipse at the same time. That meant the storm hit Boston later than it hit Philadelphia. But that seemed odd because, of course, a nor'easter gets its name because the winds come from the northeast. Okay? But in point of fact, uh, what we now know and what Franklin realized then is those storms travel up the coast from the southwest to the northeast. So it was the first example that storm systems don't necessarily move in the direction where you're experiencing the wind from. And it also realized Franklin realized if you had a fast enough method of communication, people in the south could warn people in the north that there was a storm coming. So in many ways, it was a foretaste of modern meteorology. People had always wanted to be able to predict the weather. Kepler spent a lot of time thinking about it. They just weren't good at it. It just was too hard to do. Um, OK. And yes, let's say one more eclipse, and then well, well, I guess we can go a couple of sides and then leave some time for questions. Um, Yes, so a little payback from the Native Americans. OK, so probably people have heard of Tecumseh, great leader of the Shawnee, who tried to get the American Indian nations of the old Northwest, so we're talking Ohio, Indiana, uh, then a frontier region, to unite, to hold back the Americans. Difficult thing to do, though. Um, and he had a brother called the Shawnee Prophet. And he was a great religious leader, so he was having some success in uniting people under his banner. And so William Henry Harrison, later to be a president of the United States, decided to try to take the Shawnee prophet down a peg or two. And he said, wrote an open letter or something, or sent a message around to various nations of the Native Americans to say, um, you know, if this guy was really in tune with the gods, uh, he would be able to, for instance, 
make some predictions or do some work some wonders, you know. So see if he can do anything like that. Well, the next thing you know, the Shawnee prophet said, okay, I predict there's going to be a total eclipse of the sun. And there was. So all of a sudden, he had totally answered uh, William Henry Harrison, uh, who unfortunately just went ahead and massacred his people in, a fa in an infamous battle uh, at Tippecanoe, and that parlayed that into becoming president. But anyway, uh, we don't know, of course, how the Shawnee prophet predicted the eclipse, but it is likely that he was able to do it from an almanac. There were already settlers spreading into the Ohio River Valley. Eclipse prediction had gotten very good. Um, in fact, uh, it was this eclipse that was one of the first eclipses where astronomers traveled to see it. Uh, an astro a Spanish astronomer traveled from Cuba to upstate New York, Jose de Ferrer, and he is the person who gave the one of the first detailed descriptions of the corona, and he gave it the name. It's the Spanish for crown. Um, so it may be, of course, that he simply turned around the European zone uh, technology by take getting a hold of an almanac. We don't really know any more than we know how Thales predicted the eclipse. Uh, and I guess there is time then to just say uh, that the person who actually gave us our modern system of predicting eclipses so accurately, accurately was Friedrich Bessel. If we have any mathematicians, you may have heard of Bessel functions, a famous mathematician of this early 19th century. He was an astronomer at the observatory in Königsberg, which is now, uh, it's in Eastern Europe, it's now Kalin, known as Kaliningrad in, this, in Russia. Um, and uh, he knew that the eclipse would pass so that the track the edge of the track would pretty much be right over the observatory. And you may remember that Halley could draw the track, but 10 miles out. So that wouldn't be much good to poor old Bessel. He needed to know as close as possible, can I just stay in my comfortable observatory, or am I going to have to move my ass over a bit? So he decided to come up with a new programmatic method called the Bessalian elements. He could calculate it precisely, and more importantly, anyone else could use the same method to do the same thing. So he was able to determine, yeah, I am going to see it in my eclipse and he was able to observe the annular eclipse of that year, 1836. And um, he, uh, his method is still the one that's used today. So in each country, there are a very small number of people. I'm hoping to get to interview one, but the, the, the one I know about, I think he, he's, he's retired and I have to get a hold of him. The people who actually do it, there are not that many because, of course, it's a, it's a, and this guy, for instance, that I'm speaking of, who has a book available, if anyone's really keen, I'll, I'll, I'll give you the details so you can look up his book. Um, he is the one who has calculated the canon of eclipses at NASA. So if you go to NASA's eclipse website, you can see the date and time and, and where it was visible for all eclipses for about a 5,000 year period. You can imagine calculating that many eclipses takes a while. So he was the guy who patiently did all that. Of course, now you can use computers to help you, admittedly. Uh, and so there are a few people who have the highly specialized technical knowledge to do it. And it was only at this point in the late 19th century that people were able to do it. Um, so I don't think that there's time. I don't want to trespass too far on you to get all the way to Einstein. But I'll just remind you where we started. Uh, I'll show you a picture from that eclipse. Let's just skip forward. All sorts of exciting stories of daring do there. Uh, there's a great picture of Einstein's eclipse. So kinds of things you can see during an eclipse. If there's a solar flare or prominence where gas from the surface of the sun leaps up into the solar atmosphere, well, when you cut out the main body of the sun, you can see those details, right? They're right and visible. And so they got a perfect picture of one of these very large prominences during the 1919 eclipse. Who knows what we might see uh, in the eclipse of 2024. So I'll throw the floor open to questions. <laughs> We're from Philadelphia, and it's always overcast when anything interesting Yes, that's yes, right. Yes, I can tell you, being from Ireland, uh, uh, I went out many is the night and occasional days. We, the transit of Venus, that, that occurred twice in our lifetimes. Once we were in Ireland, no chance, but we got a great view of it here in <laughs> Fedville. Uh, yes, lots of disappointed nights you know, when you try to go out in a cloudy climate. The record in Ireland, which actually for a while was a center of astronomy, but it's a sucky place to do astronomy. The record for Ireland in the west of Ireland, where I'm from, is most cloudy days in the year, 322. Uh, that's not just cloudy days, that's rainy days yeah, out of 365. So. Yeah, so some places are definitely better for astronomy than others. Any other questions? 
Einstein sort of uses a proof for relativity, seeing the star behind the sun. Mm -hmm. What year was that? Uh, so his prediction uh, was, uh, his first prediction was essentially in 1912. His improved prediction, which included uh, the curvature of space-time, it was in 1915. And the test was carried out in 1919. And of course, people kept doing the test in science. You, you don't take somebody's word for it. You replicate it. And they kept doing the test. And in fact, people that I know will carry out the test again at the 2024 eclipse. So we still try to do science at eclipses. Although, it is also true that scientists are ingenious people. And one thing about the history of eclipses, so starting in 1836, scientists started to travel to eclipses. And they started to do important scientific work, which I didn't have time to tell you about, at these eclipses. And uh, gradually, they figured out, once they had learned something about the sun at an eclipse, they would usually figure out, oh, I now can think of a way that we could see that without the eclipse. So it probably is true that we passed the high peak of eclipse observations around about 1919. And we're sort of on the downward curve. Science is still done at eclipses, but it's usually not quite as vital to see it. Uh, it's usually not quite as groundbreaking as it was back in the day a century or so ago. Now you've reached the stage that my students reach, which is don't ask him another question, because he's just going to go. So um, obviously, the the tire dome you were talking about can accurately predict uh, yes. very expertly eclipses out yeah. apparently 5,000 years in the future. And yeah. as you were talking about, we can do it more than 2,000 years in the past mm -hmm. quite accurately. The lads here are using the Antikythera. Is there any way to know by looking at yes. this device how far they could accurately predict an eclipse? They've done an amazing amount with the Antikythera mechanism. There's a great book about the reconstruction of the mechanism using, they don't take it apart, of course, they just use special imaging to sort of work out what the cogs were like. And they can definitely work out what it was used for. Um, I don't think from the mechanism that it's that easy to tell precisely how accurate it was. But we do have Ptolemy's book in which he tells us how he predicted an eclipse. So we can compare Ptolemy's method with modern methods and with other. I've, of course, focused on a story which takes us from the Middle East through Europe to America. Uh, but of course, there were Chinese and Indian astronomers and in other places observing eclipses. And both the Chinese and the Indians did try to produce prediction methods. And so there is a, an interesting paper which discusses how they all compare. And Ptolemy is actually pretty good, uh, but some of the time he would actually just falsely predict an eclipse that wouldn't happen. And generally, there was room for errors of, on the order of hours or maybe even a day or two. And he was probably a bit better, but not a huge amount better than, let's say, the Indians, for instance. Um, so in short, they were good, but certainly not perfect. And we presume that the Antikythera mechanism if you went to the trouble of making this beautiful instrument, you probably did it, uh, tried as hard as you could to make it level with the best science of the day, which would have been Ptolemy and, and Hipparchus. So it seems reasonable that it was about that level. Okay, well, thank you all for coming out. And I hope that you have clear skies for the eclipse. And uh, enjoy it.